Bonjour, Eric Campanini, mon commodérateur à gauche, et moi, Myrta Lorenzo. Nous aimerions vous souhaiter la bienvenue à tous, que vous soyez en ligne ou en salle. Uh, we are here at round table number two, uh, empowering workers. It's about towards responsi responsible use and management of artificial intelligence and algorithmic management in the workplace. We are honored to have with us today important and very interesting speakers. We have with us Ekehard Ernst, to my left, Chief Macroeconomist at the International Labour Organization and Chairman of the Geneva Macro Labs. Christy Hoffman, Secretary General at the UNI Global Union. Uh, Jeremy Gignot Katz, Algorithmic Management Director at Le Plus Important. Mariel Oliveira, Director for Partnerships and Operational Program Monitoring at UNESCO. Sector for Communication and Information, and Sally Radwan, Artificial Intelligence Advisor to the Minister at the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology in Egypt. So let us immediately open the debate, first noting for all of us that with algorithm management, which may sound like a weird concept, we mean actually the use of artificial intelligence at work. So this said, over to you, Eric. Yes, thank you very much. And um, as you can see, Christy is uh, online. And uh, normally, Christy, you can hear us, uh, and you will, you will move to, to the different questions. Uh, the, the idea of this round table is to have definitely key recommendations. The subject is quite complex, but the idea is please, uh, eminent speakers, keep things simple and very, very pragmatic. So to open the round table, I have a question for you, uh, Libera. I know. Could you please shape the, what, what is AI and how does it impact actually labor? A broad vision just to introduce uh, the discussion. And you can you can stay here and and that yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thank you. Oh wow, what a question uh, <laughs> to start. Well, thank you very much uh, for first for giving uh, you know for giving me the floor on that you know, uh, and, and let me start by saying that um, you know. Um, Computers have been around since, you know, for 80, 80 years right now, but they started really affecting the world of work, you know, in about 40 years ago, you know, when the first personal computers came on, you know, uh, um, around and then people, you know, really had the opportunity to, you know, have massive access to information. And of course, the first users of computers were actually, actually because of their cost in the workplace. And... Um, you know, so because they were working, you know, there are there are major investments uh, in the workplace. You know, people placed a lot of uh, of uh, let's say expectation that they were actually, you know, um, going to be you know a major tool for, for productivity. And uh, indeed, you know, uh, uh, they were used essentially for that to automate operations. And the hopes in that were that uh, you know work that would be um, how do we say. Um, uh, drudgery and uh, you know routine tasks that uh, that required more muscle than actually brains would actually be you know far away and people would be more creative you know and able to 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 use uh, creativity more. Now we actually you know see the extreme automation of that, which is you know what we call artificial intelligence in a way. You know it's uh, essentially the algorithms are you know uh, that we're talking about for management are the mechanisms by which you harvest uh, data and use this data to actually derive some uh, um, rules or, or processes by which you can accelerate automation of, uh, of, uh, of tasks uh, using recognition of, uh, of uh, certain tasks and uh, you know, uh, or, or machine learning uh, mechanisms to actually use uh, to, to improve you know, the quality or the quantity or the speed you know, in, in which you, you are doing you know, um, uh, work, you know, specifically speaking of the world, uh, world of work. 
Um, and, um, you know, in the end, there are many different ways in which, you know, the algorithms have been affecting work, you know, and actually it, they've been affecting work in ways that we haven't really expected, you know, because in the beginning it was about the unemployment, uh, you know, computers will displace people and people will be unemployed, you know, big fear. But actually the more technology you have, actually the more technology, the more people, people you need to create and manage and use the technology, you know, so that's not what worked, uh, uh, what uh, the effect was. But the effect was, uh, you know, to me, you know, in a few categories. First, who enters the workspace, you know, the workplace, and in what conditions? You know, entering the workspace, you know, like uh, artificial intelligence is being used now to, you know, to recruit people. You know, and the recruitment process is about identifying, you know, uh, uh, who, is a, who is the optimal work to fulfill a certain function or task. And uh, in this process, usually, you know, uh, it's using machine learning, looking at past CVs and successful candidates in order to say, okay, so who is most likely to be a successful candidate of the CVs I have? Problem with that, you know, two problems. Number one, past CVs are white male able-bodied, you know, uh, uh, and so discrimination actually becomes baked in, you know, uh, uh, in many different ways. Minorities and et cetera, they fall, you know, fall behind. And the other sec and the second process that is a problem with that is that these algorithms tend to be black boxes, so somebody doesn't get hired. And neither the candidate nor the, nor the actual human resources manager know why, you know, so the, the sometimes this, the decision is with factors that we don't even know about. So, um, you know, what else, uh, um, you know, is the effect? So entering in the workforce. Then we have the actual sting in the workforce, you know, uh, and uh, we're talking about the fact that, uh, you know, algorithms are, you know, derived from data that is actually derived from extreme surveillance of people. You know, and the surveillance of people is actually a major invasion of privacy to begin with. And particularly when we blur the boundaries between workplaces and home life or private, you know, a non-work life, you know, like we've been doing uh, with telecommuting over the pandemic, you know, so uh, the fact that we are harvesting data from people, monitoring them closely with cameras, with apps in your phone and et cetera, you know, it's extracting that data, you know, from people in order to micromanage them means that actually we've been micromanaging them to, to harm, in harmful ways, as a matter of fact, you know, in, in many different ways. In, in the Middle Ages, you know, you could say that people were actually responsible for an entire product. You know, they, the craftsperson started from zero, you know, and produced an entire product. Nowadays, they produce only a micro part of a, of a, a particular product, a micro task, and they are recompensed in, with micro Ta, you know, payments as well, which actually means that, uh, you know, work has lost the benefits and the compensation that it used to have. Um, you know, the benefits, the contracts, the, the retirement plans, the, you know, the, the vacation, you know, those fall apart because they're, you know, we have the gig economy now. So, um, you know, the, who can enter the workplace, who, how the workplace, you know, the, the workers are managed, and then, you know, you have, uh, you know, other elements that I would like to mention as well, but uh, we will come back to them, you know, so thank you in the interest of, uh, of time. Okay, so thank, thank you very much. Thank you I'm enthusiastic about this topic. And, and we, we do come back in this way. Uh, thank, thank you. And so thank you very much. And, and to, we could move on later on on, on the different topic you just uh, highlight here. Um, thank you, Art. Uh, what is from your perspective? Um, why is algorithmic management a major issue? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, and, and great to be here with all, with all of you. Um, let me first maybe to react too quickly to what, what was just said before. I think that what's interesting about these new algorithms is uh, two things. First of all, um, we haven't seen much of the benefits yet. Uh, I mean, the, actually, Robert Solo, the Nobel Prize winner in economics, uh, once said uh, we see the computers everywhere but in the data. And all these productivity gains we don't see them yet, and we don't see them with, uh, as algor um, with algorithmic management either. Uh, so it's actually c quite puzzling why p uh, companies spend so much money on these on these tools, and we don't really get so much benefits of, out of it. And I think that the, the reason of that is, at least at the level of uh, of, of businesses, twofold. First of all, 
understanding, uh, for, to understand these algorithms, you have to see that it's not only about automation, it's about prediction. These, these algorithms predict what, you know, what kind of talent you can hire, what type of, of uh, tasks come up, what type of, of uh, work, uh, work you're supposed to do. But that means there's a lot of standardization going on. So it's, it, you guess it basically press the entire workforce into certain ca really broad categories in order to be able to train these tools properly. Yeah? And so you pass, uh, you, uh, you, you pass aside a lot of hidden talent. You, know, you basically miss a lot of hidden talent that might be in your enterprise, might be, in your, might be on the market that you don't really see. And so, so they actually the, these prediction tools in a sense miss the point. Right? So it's rather than kind of trying to figure out uh, wh where you can really create value and bring in new talent, you actually kind of only try to automate, uh, automate the process in order to make it faster. And at, at the end of the day, you lose out. Uh, um. The second point is, uh, I think, on, in, storm, on, in terms of the, um, the surveillance aspect that was mentioned and which, which I totally agree or, or, or subscribe to as well. The problem is that is, those companies who, who collect these data, which are very few at the end, uh, they collect much more data than they actually need for their, for their tools, and they prevent other companies and other uh, um, uh, customers to actually access some of this data. So, so in a sense, you create tools that are relevant only for a very small part of the market. We don't really create uh, um, tools that are relevant for, for larger um, um, uh, for a larger group of companies, for a larger group of, of uh, uh, customers, for a larger group of employees. Now, the question was, well, why, uh, why is it so important? Why, do you, why should we care about this? And I think that the, the reason I, I want to give a bit of context to, to, to my answer is that uh, we actually, s we, we are seeing a major transformation of our labor markets. I mean, f uh, future of work is a topic that, that uh, the ILO has, has been uh, pushing uh, for quite some time now, and I mean, you're all aware of this. We work longer. We have much more diverse forms of, of skills and competence. We actually are, on average, much more educated than we used to be. Um, increasingly, employers seem to find uh, seem to have challenges to find new talent. Um, that's not only true for truck drivers in the UK; it's also true in, in, in many other areas. Um, and and we see increasingly diverse challenges for different groups in the labour market. Young people have enormous challenges to get the right education with the, with the pandemic. Uh, they're, they're left uh, is for a large part uh, without proper uh, preparation for the labour market, etc. Hi hybrid forms, work forms are, are challenging, makes it challenging actually for employers to, to deal with it. So in a sense, all these challenges that companies face and that, uh, that companies and employees face uh, on the labour market could potentially be addressed by, help, by, by using this algorithm to, to, uh, to bring a better matching on the, on the labor market. So br bring people together that, that want to come together, bring uh, companies and uh, um, uh, uh, finding, help, help companies finding the talent, help employees or future employees to identify what come for the possible career pathways there are. And so that's, that's uh, against these type of challenges against which I would see that algorithmic management, broadly speaking, not only in, inside companies, but uh, as, as a tool to kind of help uh, markets functioning better is, is potentially important. But that means that you basically need to identify um, the talent, you need to identify a broad uh, kind of uh, uh, range of competencies. You need to identify possible career paths. Some, some uh, um, public institutions actually are doing this already. In Singapore, uh, you have Skills Future Singapore is trying to do that, to identify possible ca career pathways to help you to help you guide, navigate the labor market before you actually lose your job. Huh? So it's the, the, the point is that rather than kind of waiting until you lose your job and you go to, to your local uh, uh, public employment services, you actually navigate, help people navigate the labor market in, in anticipation. Again, prediction of what can uh, happen. And then I think an important point, and, it, and that's again where, where this, this standardization is so, uh, so pernicious, is the, these tools could potentially help us to to actually better achieve what Scott Page calls the diversity bonus. We all have this uh, intuitive uh, f sense that by having a more diverse work for workforce, and that's not only gender balance, it's, 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 it's a large range of diversity that, that, we can, that we can integrate, we actually become better companies, become even more pro pro uh, um, productive companies, and we become, become, more, become, be, become happier employees. So in principle, these tools could help us if they were not so standardized, if they were kind of really kind of developing uh, uh, um, 
in, in along this along this diversity axis um, as well. So I think these are the tools, and uh, I, I, I like very much what Anonet was saying before. Anonet was saying before, it's not about regulation; it's about new, developing new tools in order to address these issues. Thank you. So, thanks, thanks, thank you, Eckhart. And uh, Christy, uh, you are with us online, and I'm sure you would like to react with on what just Rivera and, and Eckhart said. Um, could, could you share maybe uh, current use cases of AI application within the organization? And considering your unique position, uh, could you also share with us, according to you, what should be the role of trade union in, in this very complex question? Thank you, Eric, and thanks for the invitation to join. We cannot hear you. Okay, I'm, yes, I'm not yes. muted. And, and <laughs> Um, so thanks for the invitation to join you today. Um, I, I want to say from the workers' side, during the, the perspective is that during the pandemic in particular, the use of these surveillance technologies and AI and algorithmic management, which were already well underdeveloped, uh, already under development, um, but the use has exploded, supported by both the growth of remote work and the growth of e-commerce. Um, so if you look at, for example, one case I'll give you is the case of Amazon, where just the warehouse workers of 1.3 million warehouse employees are relentlessly monitored, evaluated, subjected to very high pressure and grueling conditions. They're pressured to make a rate of uh, sometimes around 100 things an hour from, to take them from the shelves of the warehouse. And all of this is supported by various kinds of surveillance and scanners, which measure and direct every motion. And employees are even marked down for time off tasks when they leave the workstation to use the bathroom, leading many of them to avoid hydration uh, in order to avoid getting the points taken off. Um, so as a result of this, we, we see industry leading injury rates um, and also just very high levels of stress and anxiety. Um, uh, and just to take this a little further to address these issues, California just passed a law a few weeks ago, which would ensure that the productivity demands on the workers doesn't come at the expense of health and safety. So they get breaks that they deserve, but also it forces Amazon to disclose to workers the production quotas that they're required to meet. And again, none of these monitoring methods are completely new, but bringing all this technology together at the workplace creates an environment of scale um, that we have not seen in the past. Um, and just another example is in the call center industry where alongside the rapid introduction of remote work, telework, companies are using very sophisticated monitoring programs in workers' homes, which really takes it out of the warehouse into the bedroom, kitchen, uh, and if you're lucky, a home office. But let's say the call center workers typically don't have that. So, Again, we've seen this start to be addressed when court already decided teleperformance, which is the French call center, the biggest one in the industry worldwide, that it was a violation of privacy to have cameras in their homes. But in Colombia, uh, again, teleperformance, largest employer in the country, uh, the local contract includes nonstop video monitoring, biometric details, photos can be shared of your family and children with uh, on, online. So all of this takes a very big toll, um, hyper-connectivity syndrome, psychosocial stress with all of its manifestations. And I would argue it's especially egregious when taking place inside a home. So as for unions, um, well, you won't be surprised that um, you know, from our point of view, this needs to be negotiated, part of collective bargaining. Unions need to be empowered to negotiate the terms of monitoring, how much and for what purpose uh, worker, worker data is collected, how it's stored, uh, and very specifically the production targets, disciplinary actions should not result from and monitoring uh, artificial intelligence um, monitoring. And that means disciplinary actions, dismissals have to be taken by a human. There must be a human in command. You cannot have the algorithm saying this person needs to be made redundant because they haven't made their rate. Uh, we think unions should also influence the design of the algorithms that use the data 
and this is not unheard of. Spanish unions just want a new law, uh, giving them the right to negotiate over the algorithm in the app-based taxi industry, the Ubers of the world. Courts in Italy have also ruled on this question because the apps can be discriminatory when it comes to ranking. And then, um, you know, also unions always have historically and will continue to take a big role in health and safety. We want health and safety inspectorates and, regular, and regulators to recognize we need a new, uh, new regime for health and safety when it comes to the use of AI at work. We want new tools and rules for ensuring that the workplace is free from these sort of fact-breaking targets um, and psychic terrorism, which degrades workers. Uh, and, and unions have a big role to play with that through uh, health and safety committees on the job. I mean, this California law is a good start. It shows that, yes, we do recognize this is a safety issue, but you know, we all need a new digital safety regime in addition to unions on the job. And I just also want to mention this question of continuous algorithm surveillance should be banned at work unless it's really needed for a legitimate health and safety reason. Um, you know, and there must, there should really be, and I think that first speaker alluded to this, a principle of proportionality. Surveillance and the collection of data have to be linked to a legitimate purpose and need. Um, you know, otherwise you're getting all this data collected. Why do you need the family pictures of, of a call center worker in, in Colombia? All this data for no reason, and it, it kind of, it strips away any level of uh, privacy and dignity that workers should have on the job. So I think I've probably exceeded my time. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Christy, and thank you for introducing pragmatic use cases and recommendation, and also the role of trade union uh, in, the, in this complex question. I'm going to move in French. Uh, Jérémy, um, vous, vous avez contribué à, notamment à, à un livre blanc que vous avez pu récupérer, effectivement, à la sortie, là, sur uh, l'IA au travail, uh, avec une vingtaine de propositions très pragmatiques, de recommandations. Euh, Est-ce que vous pouvez partager quelques éléments en rebond par rapport à ce qui a été dit par nos trois amis jusque-là Bien sûr, avec plaisir et merci infiniment. Le droit du travail actuel est encore centré sur des réflexes et une organisation qui sont très numériques. Or, euh, le défi que nous devons tous relever, c'est que l'outil algorithmique est nouveau, il est opaque et il vient se greffer sur l'exécution d'un contrat, euh, contrat de travail qui est fondé sur la loyauté et assorti d'une obligation d'information, d'un devoir d'information. Donc le défi est grand pour faire cohabiter notre droit du travail avec ce nouvel outil et notamment euh, cette, cette opacité critique. Dans le cadre du livre blanc, nous proposons une série de principes directeurs euh, qui devraient justement présider à l'encadrement, pas nécessairement la régulation, mais l'encadrement euh, de ce nouveau mode opératoire. Donc, les, les points saillants de ces principes directeurs sont, sont les suivants. Tout d'abord, les entreprises ont d'abord et avant tout des droits. On parle beaucoup de, de réguler leurs pratiques, mais elles ont également des droits, notamment le fait que la régulation, le, le, le régime juridique à venir respecte leur propriété intellectuelle, garantisse leur capacité d'innovation et garantisse plus largement un jeu concurrentiel équitable entre les acteurs du marché, d'autant que ce, mar ce marché spécifique, celui de l'intelligence artificielle, est particulièrement international et concurrentiel. Face à ces droits, les entreprises ont aussi des responsabilités, des devoirs face à leurs salariés, garantir les droits du travailleur tout naturellement, comme elles sont censées le faire d'ores et déjà, mais également donc, dans les procédures internes, mais également en amont face aux fournisseurs d'algorithmes, puisque ce point est d'une importance essentielle. N'oublions jamais que l'employeur, dans 90% des cas, n'est pas celui qui a conçu l'algorithme. Il ne le comprend même pas. Il met en œuvre auprès de sa population de salariés un algorithme qu'il ne comprend pas. Ce, ce point est vraiment important. Les entreprises devront aussi informer en détail les salariés relativement euh, à, euh, au contenu de l'algorithme et la façon dont il va affecter euh, leur euh, évolution de carrière. Euh, un rôle crucial dans le maintien de l'employabilité euh, de la part de l'entreprise est également euh, essentiel. L'intelligence euh, artificielle devrait par ailleurs, dans sa mise en œuvre, être un sujet euh, du dialogue social au sein de l'entreprise. Et naturellement, pour vérifier euh, que tout cela est bel et bien mis en œuvre, des audits externes euh, de l'IA euh, devraient, euh, devraient être possibles également euh, au sein de l'entreprise. Les travailleurs, quant à eux, ils ont des droits que nous connaissons tous, mais qui devraient être réaffirmés à l'aune de cette nouvelle technologie et de tout ce qu'elle permet désormais. 
Le droit à la dignité, de, nombreux, euh, de nombreuses interventions ont insisté à raison euh, sur ce point. Le droit à la dignité qui prend la forme d'abord et avant tout du droit à la vie privée, qui se floute de plus en plus à l'heure où la crise euh, du coronavirus a fait sauter le tabou du télétravail, où la frontière entre vie privée et vie professionnelle est de plus en plus floue. C'est également l'égalité de traitement, un droit qui correspond au fait de ne pas être discriminé, un droit à la santé qui prend notamment la forme de la, risque, la prévention des risques psychosociaux, mais c'est aussi un droit à l'autonomie des travailleurs. Et ce droit à l'autonomie, directement en lien également avec la dignité, remettre l'humain au centre de l'activité, est crucial. Cette autonomie, elle revêt plusieurs formes. C'est le droit de comprendre le traitement algorithmique dont on est l'objet. C'est aussi le droit de contester une décision algorithmique. Et c'est encore le droit de solliciter une décision humaine, comme j'aurai l'occasion d'y revenir. Nous émettons également dans le cadre de notre livre blanc des principes directeurs euh, qui euh, sont destinés au pouvoir public et euh, je vous invite à, à en prendre connaissance. J'insiste juste sur un point, bien sûr, les pouvoirs publics ont un rôle à, à jouer en matière de maintien de l'employabilité, mais aussi et surtout, ils sont face à un défi. Les algorithmes évoluent sans cesse. 24 heures sur 24. Les algorithmes créent de l'algorithme. Donc la régulation à venir doit être tout aussi agile. Ça implique une haute fréquence de révision des normes et une large place laissée à l'expérimentation. Deux exemples concrets de, de recommandations euh, que nous émettons dans le cadre de notre livre blanc. Euh, nous, proposons, nous en proposons une vingtaine, mais j'en retiens euh, deux dans le cadre de cette intervention. Tout d'abord, le droit à la décision humaine que j'ai déjà mentionné. L'article 22 du RGPD a introduit un droit de ne pas faire l'objet d'une décision fondée exclusivement sur un traitement automatisé. Mais c'est un droit ineffectif, osons le mot, purement formel, qu'un qu travailleur ne peut pas véritablement mettre en œuvre. En effet, appliqué à l'entreprise, il suffira à l'employeur de dire « j'ai vérifié, cela me semble juste » ou bien d'affirmer qu'il a contribué à la décision algorithmique, même si ce n'est qu'en un clic. La CNIL elle-même n'est pas satisfaite de cet article 22 et recommande que l'on passe à un niveau supérieur avec un droit à la supervision. Nous pensons qu'il faut aller encore plus loin et consacrer un droit à la décision humaine, c'est-à-dire pouvoir permettre, permettre aux salariés d'exiger de son employeur qu'il prenne lui-même la décision. Vous imaginez bien sûr les bénéfices pour les, employeurs, pour les salariés, mais il existe aussi des bénéfices pour les employeurs dans la mesure où, encore une fois, cela remet l'humain au centre, cela redonne le pouvoir à un employeur qui, je l'indiquais auparavant, 9 fois sur 10, ne comprend pas lui-même l'algorithme qu'il met en œuvre. Donc il s'agit de lui rendre le pouvoir, euh, a, le pouvoir de direction qu'il a euh, dans le code du travail et qui est euh, tout aussi crucial que les droits des salariés. Donc... J'en viens à une deuxième recommandation, et encore une fois pour les 18 ou 19 autres, je me permets de vous renvoyer à notre livre blanc. Nous recommandons également qu'un principe d'explicabilité des algorithmes trouve sa place dans le projet de règlement de la Commission européenne sur l'intelligence artificielle. Une analogie est possible avec ce qui se passe avec la loi, avec l'inflation législative, notamment si l'on s'adosse à l'adage que l'on connaît tous, « code is law ». Le Conseil constitutionnel français a en effet reconnu la valeur, euh, une valeur constitutionnelle à l'objectif d'accessibilité et d'intelligibilité de la loi. Quiconque a déjà ouvert un code général des impôts comprendra qu'effectivement l'objectif devait être écrit quelque part. L'opacité enfin, en matière de, de management algorithmique, l'algorithme s'intercale dans une relation contractuelle. Or, le contrat est la loi des parties. Il est donc légitime que cette loi, cette loi des parties, soit accessible et soit intelligible, soit explicable. L'opacité des algorithmes, y compris pour les autorités de contrôle, est véritablement un enjeu fondamental et un risque majeur. Pour un cas extrême, rappelons-nous du logiciel MCAS euh, d'aide au pilotage des Boeing 737 MAX. Ce logiciel, ce logiciel avait été validé par les autorités de régulation américaines alors qu'elles n'avaient pas l'expertise euh, pour le valider. Et c'est Boeing seul, euh, auteur de l'algorithme, qui, qui avait cette expertise. Euh, le résultat, cette lacune euh, a malheureusement pu fortement contribuer aux événements que l'on connaît. Donc seul un principe d'explicabilité des algorithmes va permettre de redonner un vrai pouvoir de contrôle aux régulateurs, de réduire les risques de discrimination, etc. Une précision technique toutefois que je me dois de partager avec vous, l'algorithme, qu'est-ce que c'est C'est une somme d'équations. Or, le modèle mis en œuvre, c'est la formule avec les données qui ont alimenté cet algorithme, ce que l'on appelle le set d'apprentissage. Or, dans 9 cas sur 10, les biais et discriminations sont dans les imperfections de ce set d'apprentissage, pas dans l'algorithme. Donc, il est crucial que ce principe d'explicabilité s'applique tout autant au code, à l'algorithme et au set d'apprentissage. Merci. Merci, Jérémy. Euh, Sally, could you give us um, an international, international perspective from uh, um, 
a developing economy. You just arrived yesterday specifically for this event. Thank you very much from Egypt. And it will be highly interesting to, to have your point of view and just to start to react on what I've just said. Uh, thank you, Eric, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much to the uh, organizers for uh, for inviting me. Um, do we did we manage to get the slides on or yeah, no? Ah, okay, okay, okay. yes. Um, so uh, let me uh, maybe widen the um, the the perspective a little bit of of the conversation uh, here, and then. Um, Hopefully, you'll also see the link to the to the topic of of this uh, panel. Um, the slide you see in front of you, which uh, I'm sure many of you have seen before, uh, this is from the early days of Google Photos uh, when it first started uh, learning how to identify objects and images. And uh, as you can see, it did pretty well on buildings, on um, planes, even some events. But show it a picture of uh, two Africans, especially if one of them is a woman, and it starts calling them gorillas. Now, why did that happen? It happened because um, the first generation of Google Photos was actually trained on a very particular data set from Yahoo image search between the years of 2002 and 2004. And the most photographed person on the planet during those years was President George W. Bush of the United States. And more than 70, I think, 73% of pictures within that data set represented white middle-aged men, back to the point that Marielza was making earlier. Um, and so the system became pretty good at identifying those people, white middle-aged men, not so good at identifying anyone else. Now, this, in my opinion, sums up um, a huge problem with AI systems in general, which, of course, also applies to algorithmic management and, and labor-related issues. Um, with the just rush, I, I often liken it to the gold rush, um, that's now going on to develop new products, new AI technologies, bring them to market faster, beat the competition faster. Companies will often use whatever data is available, just, just enough to achieve the desired accuracy just enough to beat the competition and to, to produce something that looks and, and acts great. Um, and then once that's done, okay, let's roll it out globally because the investors demand that. Um, but it just so happens that a system developed in Palo Alto, California doesn't immediately work as well in Babeluk, which is a district in Cairo, Egypt. Um, if it hasn't been trained on relevant data, if it hasn't been adapted to the local context, if it wasn't developed with the input of the people who are ultimately going to be involved in, in using it, then we're likely to see results like these. Um, and whether it's image identification, decision making, algorithmic management, whatever the use case, one of the biggest challenges that developing countries specifically face is having these systems uh, that were developed elsewhere being imposed on them without them having any say in how they were developed or trained, which, as the picture above illustrates, um, could lead to catast catastrophic results. And, and it's particularly problematic now because, um, as we know, um, AI heavily relies on data. It wasn't so much a problem when it was all rule-based and we could potentially easily change the rules. Um, and, but also collecting and storing vast amounts of data comes with its own set of challenges uh, around privacy, as we said, but also respecting local laws, um, even the environmental impact of processing such large data sets in, and, and um, creating complicated deep learning models. So we're, if we're serious about using AI responsibly, there's no other way but to do a thorough impact assessment before deploying it. And what does an assessment look like? Um, in my opinion, it starts with asking some basic questions. Do we really need AI to solve this particular problem? Do we really, you know, we don't really have to use the technology it's just because it's there. Many people take that for granted, but it's really not the case. But then it goes on to things like the financial impact, the economic impact. We talked briefly about job losses. Um, and which is a huge problem for, for Egypt, for, for example, and the financial upside is not always clear because in my country it's not necessarily a good idea, um, you know, a financial even benefit to replace humans with, with machines, even thinking machines. 
Um, so we need to take into account different economic structures, different labor costs, the social impact, the environmental impact. And only when we're satisfied that the benefits of the system outweigh the risks it potentially poses, then we can think about going ahead and deploying it. And one way to ensuring this is by making sure that people are aware of AI and its risks and benefits, which takes us to the second slide, if we're able to, to change it, please. Um, uh, because this impact assessment needs to be a multi-stakeholder uh, conversation, we need to make sure that everyone involved in the AI ecosystem is aware of what's going on and has the uh, the right uh, know-how. Um, I'm sorry, the, the font got a little bit screwed up due to different formats, but uh, essentially this is the, the capacity building framework that we've developed for AI in Egypt. And uh, we're a nation of pyramid builders. We like our pyramids, so everything has to be in pyramids. So we created two here. Um, the one on the right is for non-technical roles. Um, and these are based on the roles that people would ultimately, ultimately play in an AI ecosystem. So the non-technical roles start with the general public. What do they need to know about AI? And then goes into school children, um, non-technical students, professionals, and ultimately leaders within government, private sector, NGOs, everything. And then the one on the left um, talks about technical roles and goes into different levels of granularity. And what we've done is identify the educational needs for each of these rungs of the two pyramids, and then we've translated them into a number of programs. Uh, last year, we trained uh, overall more than 100,000 people. We have ambitious plans to, to increase that number across the board, also through partnerships, which um, I realize I'm out of time, so I'm not going to talk about them now, but uh, we can maybe address them in the Q&A. But I do think that public-private partnerships are potentially a really good way to extract benefits out of AI world while still implementing it responsibly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oui, bien sûr, nous sommes pile poil sur notre timing, donc je pense que nous, nous avons l'espace pour avoir un très bon débat. Je, je, je vais demander à, à nos orateurs de se centrer sur ce qui est actionnable, sur des recommandations concrètes, mais aussi aux auditeurs de poser des questions qui vont amener vers des recommandations. Et j'aimerais commencer par Christy. Christy, um, are you there? Yes, <laughs> yeah, I'm here. Christy? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, great. Um, you said very interesting things, of course, uh, like uh, the other speakers as well. Um, one interesting point was about the stress uh, would you recommend uh, to deploy audit or stress tests? And also, uh, how would you characterize the level of maturity of trade unions on algorithmic management? Over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that, that we're all seeing in every, every survey, all the research shows a huge manifestation of more stress um, during COVID among those workers who are working from home. And that could be attributed to a lot of things unrelated unreli un, un, uh, to technology, but the technological part of the increased monitoring surveillance, which really changes the relationship with the employer as well, away from sort of more of a trust-based relationship to you know, one where you've got to be accountable for every moment. Um, I, I think that, that is a, you know, is it, it's accepted that that's happening right now. And the question is stress tests. I'm not really sure um, what that means exactly. I'm not really sure about the audit factor in general. I'm not uh, comfortable with companies doing their own audits in lieu of having health and safety experts and professionals involved. And I think we do need to move to having more of a safety regime relating to technology. Um, just as we developed you know, in the 1980s, a lot of laws regarding factory safety um, in many of the advanced economies, I think now is the time to really bring in, uh, you know, ha have it taken out of the corporate control and put into 
a different kind of uh, safety framework where um, we can really look at what, what does it take? What kind, how much surveillance is enough? Is too much? What is too much? And how do we, how do we manage it to reduce that stress? And for example, by eliminating the possibility that you will be disciplined or face performance appraisal based on the surveillance um, without a human in command. I mean, that's a central, central piece that, that someone else has already mentioned is having the human engagement and, um, is really important. But so in terms of, let me just get to the other question, which I think is um, maybe I'm more better suited to answer that. And that is about the maturity of unions on this question. I was a factory worker in the 1980s and negotiated with my employer about um, numerically controlled, uh, introduction of numerically controlled machines. And I bring this up only to say that unions have been negotiating with employers about technology for decades, centuries, started out in the 1800s. And we see a huge interest among the uh, unions that uni represents across IT sector, communications, finance, uh, and many others in really going into this question of algorithmic management and learning it and coming up with solutions. Um, so I think that um, we've had already many unions engaged in some level of uh, communication, of dis negotiations. Um, you know, the right to disconnect from work is an important thing that's been on the table for quite a long time, but going beyond into algorithmic management so far, it's mainly focused on the impact rather than what's in the algorithm. So limiting, for example, um, one of our affiliates in the United States has for call centers, you've limited, they've limited the impact of the algorithmic management such that it, it can't be used for uh, discipline and performance appraisal only for feedback on how you can be better in your calls, but it can't have a negative impact, which reduces the stress uh, substantially. And you see some um, many unions starting to go down the path of, of talking directly with employers about cybersecurity, about algorithms, and so on. So this is only going to grow. We're very um, determined to engage in training and best practices. So I think our maturity is um, way beyond what many people may think, and certainly not where we need to be in order to be uh, real partners at the bargaining table. But I, as I don't think that many managers on, in, at the worksite really understand the algorithms any better than we do. Um, so uh, we're very determined to be well-informed uh, uh, social partners on this issue because anything that impacts the conditions at work um, you know, we, we need to be at the bargaining table. That, that's sort of a fundamental uh, core value that we, that we have. Thank you. Good to know. Um, Jeremy, um, uh, Le Plus Important, the white paper, has very many recommendations. You, the, because of the time allotment, you were not able to tell us uh, all of them, but I'm sure there is more, you know, the sous la planche, on dit en français, no, dans la trousse. <laughs> Are there any other recommendations you would like to, to tell us about? Il y en a une qui est effectivement mérite, euh, mérite, je pense, une, une mention importante dans le sens où elle, elle, elle est le prolongement un peu de. de là où j'ai dû m'arrêter effectivement par, <laughs> par manque de temps. Euh, J'évoquais le fait, euh, une précision technique sur le fait qu'il euh, faut distinguer l'algorithme qui est une somme d'équations du code euh, du set d'apprentissage et que les biais sont euh, très souvent dans ce set d'apprentissage. Euh, un autre intervenant a, a mentionné euh, une décision italienne, je, je pense qu'il s'agissait de la décision du tribunal de Bologne qui avait estimé effectivement, enfin qui a jugé que euh, l'algorithme de Deliveroo était discriminatoire, mais quand on voit dans les détails euh, de la décision, la discrimination n'était pas dans le code de l'algorithme, en fait l'algorithme de Deliveroo ne prenait pas en compte euh, les salariés qui ne se montraient pas pour arrêt, en raison d'un arrêt maladie ou euh, de l'exercice du droit de grève. Donc, euh, encore un très, très bon exemple du fait que ce que, ce que l'on reprochait à l'algorithme, ce n'était pas de discriminer. Euh, je vous le rappelle, c'est l'objet même d'un algorithme que de discriminer, mais de le faire sur la base d'un set d'apprentissage, d'un set d'apprentissage, de données d'apprentissage qui n'était pas exhaustive, qui n'était pas assez qualifiée, qui n'était pas assez pertinente. Or, à cet égard, nous émettons justement une recommandation euh, qui est de prévoir une mutualisation des euh, données d'apprentissage euh, des algorithmes 
pour garantir justement leur richesse, euh, leur mise en qualité, une qualité standard et minimiser les, les risques de biais par l'agrégation des, euh, des informations. Cette mutualisation, elle pourrait être confiée à des institutions tierces relevant de l'État ou des, des, fiduci, euh, des fiduciaires de données, des, des data trusts euh, qui, qui restent à déterminer. Mais nous ne sommes pas, il ne faut pas confondre avec le, le rôle des, des organismes certificateurs euh, du, du modèle européen classique euh, du nouveau cadre législatif européen euh, tel qu'on le retrouve d'ailleurs dans le projet de règlement de la Commission sur l'intelligence artificielle. Donc nous ne sommes pas sur le terrain de certificateurs, mais véritablement de data trust. Thank you so much. I would like now to turn to Sally to ask her how would you react to what has been shared so far from a developing country point of view? And actually, is there a developing country point of view to these matters? Well, I think there is. Um, and it's, uh, it's just to illustrate that there do need to be different points of view. So it doesn't just need to be developing versus developed or whatever the politically technical term of the day is for referring to, uh, to those countries, but it's, um, it's a question that, that it needs to be a multi-stakeholder conversation. There cannot be an exporter and an importer. There cannot be a manufacturer or a producer and the consumer. It cannot be that binary or that clear cut. Um, so, of course, there's the point around uh, the importance of impact assessment adapted to the local context, um, and governments have a big role to play there uh, in enforcing these impact assessment uh, methodologies, um, and also in ensuring education at all levels, as I mentioned before. Uh, the other thing I'd like to briefly get back to is the importance of partnerships, especially public-private partnerships, in not only the governance of responsible AI practices, but actually in ensuring that we extract benefit out of it. I mean, um, Eckhart was, uh, was saying earlier, and rightly so, that we haven't actually seen much of the benefit yet. And it's, it's true in many cases. Um, but it's also true that we have seen and can see some of the benefit. And I can give you an example of a couple of projects that we're doing in Egypt in AI for agriculture, for example. It's hugely beneficial. We've, we've created a, a chatbot for farmers that can give them advice on what crops to plant, how to fight pests and diseases, how to protect their land and soil and so on. And it replaces a human job, but actually one that, is, that was already disappearing, that was enormously arduous for people to carry on as um, numbers of farmers increased and, and their remits grew. And so it was practical to replace it with a chatbot. Uh, but of course, it had to be done in collaboration with the farmers, with the users who were going to use it, because you had to adapt it to those who couldn't read and write or those who couldn't uh, describe a pest very well. So you had to make it easier for them to just snap a picture of it and it would get analyzed immediately, things like that. So taking the, the, the nation building, as I like to call it, mandate of governments and the nonprofit orientation of them and pairing that with the agility, with the uh, technological focus and, and uh, competition mindset of the private sector, I think can, be, can yield very good results, except that these conversations now are mostly confined to kind of CSR budgets and, and charity departments and so on. And that needs to change, I think. It needs to be moved to the core business of companies to partner with, um, with governments in AI for development projects. So true, thank you. Uh, Marie Elsa. Yeah, can I jump in here? Because um, you know, I, I think that uh, so much of that what was said was incredibly interesting. And I want to react to, you know, to a few things. Um, first, you know, uh, with a, uh, Eckhart uh, saying about uh, the fact that we, we are not really, you know, seeing so much of the benefits. Um, and I think that it's because we actually are not measuring the benefits so much, you know, uh, uh, or we don't even have the tools to measure the benefits as much, you know, like, for example, um, one of the changes that, uh, that uh, AI has made in the workplace mm -hmm. is that, uh, you know, we, we see work, you know, completely different and then part of it is actually invisible. You know, for example, when we talk about these social media platforms, we, we all have heard the, pro the, the, the phrase that uh, we are the product, but we forgot that uh, we are also the workers there. You know, uh, we produce content. Content creation is work, you know, uh, as a matter of fact. 
and uh, you know some people make a living out of that like influencers or, or you know uh, you know different types of uh, you know social media personalities and etc and uh, we forget that but uh, and, and why don't we have that kind of measurement for the work we actually do, you know, in producing content? You know, uh, you, you mentioned the labeling of, uh, of uh, images, for example, you know, that capture thing that uh, when you have this to prove that you're not a robot, you're actually doing a micro task. You know, essentially you are labeling a picture, you know, into a micro task that is paid, you know, to some workers or asked for you for free you know, to do it as an entry, you know, uh, uh, to a specific part of a, of a behind a paywall platform. You know, so, uh, you know, we, we forget that those things are actually work and producing, you know, uh, those. Uh, we're not measuring that in our individual level and national accounting systems are actually unable to grasp that because they understand that the only value producers are actually companies households individuals are not actually seen as value producers so we need to actually start thinking about how national accounting systems should be able to capture this kind of value as well and that goes you know uh, uh, takes us from this you know uh, uh, individual level or the platform or this or that to actually a bigger you know national and global level as well and, and i'm going to echo something that sally said you know that uh, that there is no you know there should not be a distinction between you know uh, you know like uh, developing on developing countries you know uh, uh, developed countries and developing countries but there is actually some something that is really important uh platforms and uh, systems ai systems they are following the laws the regulation and uh, you know and the uh, and the standards of their headquarters where they are located where most of their workers and users and etc are probably outside of that you know uh, jurisdiction let's say so you know the thing that uh, you know we have is that kind of an imposition also of uh, legal and uh, you know principles uh, you know legal standards and etc and regulations on from outside the jurisdiction into another jurisdiction that infringes on the rights of governments to actually to regulate their own national space, their own labor, you know, uh, markets, for example. And that goes back to what, uh, you know, uh, um, and, it were, and it were saying, you know, before, you know, that we actually need something that is global in nature. We need to understand what are the principles the standards that we need to take at the global level in order to have, you know, an agreement, a global agreement on, you know, what standards that we should be following for AI, be it in the labor market, be it in the, you know, in any other uh, uh, sphere, you know, of, uh, of uh, life. And the only global standards that exist and uh, that all countries adhere to, and I'm, I'm from the UN, I'm going to have to, I will advocate for that. It's the human rights framework. You know, it, it is what it is, you know, that's exactly what everybody should be adhering to, because it's already, you know, actually international legal framework, you know, the covenants on, on uh, um, uh, civil and political rights, the covenants on economic uh, uh, um, and, uh, and social rights, they are legal frameworks. And on the basis of the legal frameworks is exactly how we should be addressing the issues of, uh, of uh, you know, privacy, of access to information, of uh, freedom of expression, and the right to work, and the right to uh, uh, health, to education, and to, you know, to decent work, you know, et cetera, which are actually where the promise of uh, AI in the in the world of work should be realized you know it's in helping farmers to to be more productive is in helping doctors to tell for, for to offer telemedicine and reach people who do not have access to you know the best medical care to empower teachers to actually provide the very best customized learning experience that improves learning outcomes that's where the promise of the of ai is in the world of work and we need to make that you know realized by actually having, you know, these international, you know, global standards and applying them, you know, uh, rigorously. The other thing we need to do, and the other recommendation, is that we need to improve digital skills for everyone. You know, as AI and uh, technology, digital technologies become incredibly ubiquitous, ubiquitous, you need to actually empower people to be online and to be meaningful online and to actually benefit from being online, you know, systems should be open. They should be accessible for persons with disabilities, for persons who speak other languages than the 70% of the content that the internet offers, which is English or, in English or Chinese, 
you know, to be able to actually benefit from what is available, you know, and, uh, and of course, and to have that kind of benefit, we're talking about a multi stakeholder conversation that needs to happen and make sure that we actually participate in that. So, um, you okay. know, and that's the wrong framework, you know, Thanks, so Marilsa. thank you. Uh, Eckhard, could we then conclude on a positive uh, impact of artificial intelligence on work? Well, I mean, I, th I think that what, what is important to stress, and, and Sally mentioned it rightly so, is we need to have a look at this from a, f I, what I call an ecosystem development. You know, you need to bring different partners, as, as Sally said, uh, uh, the multi-stakeholder approach is, is, is the right one. Because there are two, there are two things that I find are um, a bit kind of overlooked in this, in this discussion. First of all, the technology has not brought enough of the benefits that we were hoping to get. And I think that's uh, regardless of how we measure GDP or how we measure uh, national accounts, I think that is, that is more or less a, a unanimously a shared uh, conclusion. The, pro the problem for this is not that the technology cannot deliver, but rather the technology has been developed in a very specific way serving certain specific business interests and not the society at large. And I think that's an important point to stress. And, and, and for that, we need to bring in other partners and we need to bring in trade unions, we need to bring in employers, we need to bring in education institutions uh, and obviously the policy uh, uh, makers at the, at the local level. I would stress that too. You know, I think it's important not only to have national regulators, but even at the local level. And then once we have this type of ecosystem where people actually do understand the limitations of the data, the limitations of the algorithms and what these algorithms could potentially do or not, once we have this, this understanding and these, these, these partnerships, then we can actually start developing uh, algorithms and tools that really help us better navigate the uh, labor market, help us automate those, those tasks that are really tedious and, uh, uh, and repetitive that we re would like to, uh, uh, machines to take over, etc. I think that is, there is a bit of a potential, and, and, and as was mentioned before, agriculture in, in developing countries is a huge sector. 50% of employment in, in, in many developing countries is in agriculture. So having a more productive agriculture system, bringing people out of, uh, um, uh, out of uh, on account farming into a, a more um, a market oriented uh, uh, type of approaches, these tools can, can, can provide enormous benefits, but they have to be deployed at scale. And unfortunately, again, because of most of these developers of algorithms sitting in California or uh, in some in, uh, uh, European countries, they're not looking at these, these op opportunities. Yeah? Um, there are very small uh, uh, kind of uh, examples where you see this being deployed in some of these countries. Egypt is one example, I, I know examples in Tunisia as well, but it's not being developed at scale. And I think that's where, where again, where this ecosystem approach is so important and where this, this conversation we're having today is so important that we actually bring this to the table. I wanted to stress one more point because uh, Jeremy was, was mentioning as well. Uh, it's not only important to have an ecosystem approach to the development of new tech of new approaches and and creating the benefits it's also important to have an ecosystem approach to ensure that we understand and uh, regulate the risks uh, a lot of the risks is not are not fully understood um, and we don't actually have a good measure uh, of it so some of the risks relate to the fact that as, as we said before the data is not representative and so big companies actually, when they sell these algorithms, they sell algorithms to companies that actually have no use for them don't, and, and creating con conditions for, for these companies to not be uh, particularly productive. Other, um, other uh, tools or other algorithms are, are, are being geared specifically to create unfavorable conditions for workers. And I think, that, again, that's something that we need to regulate, we need to look at it. What, what Jeremy called stress test and what, what I think what is, what is important is to, to look at, at, this, at these tools, at these algorithms on the labor market, the same way we look at algorithms in the financial sector. We don't, we have not, we don't only have audits in the financial sector, we have regulators that actually understand and look at these, uh, at these tools as they're being developed in banks. So we should do the same for these tools and these algorithms being deployed in companies. And that means that we actually need to have some audit, some external audit mechanism, uh, audit companies that, we, that, that help us to do that. There are currently very few, uh, mostly NGOs, that are trying to do this. Algorithmic Watch is one, AI Institute in New York is another one. That's very few, uh, and they often operate on a non-profit basis 
depending on, on goodwill, on, uh, on do donor money, etc., there not, it's, it's, it's not a fully developed uh, is ecosystem for this type of, uh, of su surveillance and stress testing. And I think that is something where the regulator should look much more carefully in how to provide incentives for this, uh, for this, uh, this ecosystem of regulation and surveillance to, to, to be developed. And once we have this type of ecosystem, yeah, then I would agree, yes, we have the potential to create uh, enormous benefits out of these tools. Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup, merci à tous et tous. C'est peut-être le, le temps de prendre quelques questions dans la salle euh, par rapport à la richesse des recommandations que nous avons eues là. Je crois qu'il y, y a Madame. Oui, bonjour. Merci beaucoup pour pour ces interventions qui sont qui sont très riches. J'ai moi l'impression qu'on est quand même dans un débat qui, qui concerne encore très peu de gens, très peu d'entreprises euh, et surtout des pays très développés. Euh, on parlait tout à l'heure de l'Égypte, plus largement des pays, des pays en voie de développement. Euh, je pense qu'il y a, avant l'éducation, il y a un problème d'accès, il y a un problème de, alors, j'ai jamais réussi à traduire le mot, de affordability pour, euh, pour beaucoup de, de populations dans le monde. Et même dans nos pays développés, j'ai pas l'impression, pourtant, travaillant dans un grand groupe, que l'utilisation de l'IA soit totalement partagée, même auprès des leaders d'entreprise. Et, Comment est-ce qu'on fait J'aime beaucoup là-dessus là l'approche de l'Égypte avec les, les deux pyramides. Il en manque une, mais voilà, les deux pyramides qui sont qui sont très intéressantes. Qui est, effectivement, ça doit être un débat. Enfin, ça doit être quelque chose qui est propagé non pas uniquement pour les spécialistes, mais plus pour l'ensemble des salariés, l'ensemble des managers, et, et que tout le monde y ait accès et tout le monde comprenne cette problématique. Et j'ai l'impression qu'on est vraiment encore dans un débat qui est vraiment un débat de spécialistes. Qui est-ce qui veut ré réagir peut-être sur, euh, sur, sur cette question-là Est-ce qu'aujourd'hui, est, ça reste un débat de spécialistes et c'est quelque chose qui reste réservé à des pays euh, plutôt développés et ne touche pas tout le monde Bien. So, um, uh, well, I, I, think, I think for the most part, it is, you're right, it is still a debate of specialists. Um, and it's... Um, Quite often, it's not for the lack of wanting to involve uh, different groups. It's exactly as you said, it's, a, it's an education and awareness problem. We have a huge awareness problem in AI, um, not just among uh, people who are uh, disadvantaged or mar marginalized in any way, but also um, even lawmakers in many cases, and certainly the case in my country, they don't understand the basics of the technology. They don't understand many of its nuances. And so it's very hard for them to uh, to really develop laws that, that apply to it. It's, um, it's a huge problem. And, and I think if we're serious about doing AI responsibly, we have to address this problem worldwide. The other point I wanted to comment on is, is access. And it's also very true. Um, AI for maybe the third pyramid is the pyramid of um, of access to, to technology and the prerequisites that you need for AI. And if AI sits at the top of the pyramid, there are maybe five or six rungs underneath that have to do with education, with the access to infrastructure, with the access to um, digital knowledge and, and awareness and tools. And I can tell you building on the, the agriculture uh, uh, project that I mentioned earlier, um, one of the problems that we're trying to solve now is uh, not so much that people don't have access, you know, they don't have mobile phones or they don't have network coverage, but, but that data packages are expensive to use a chatbot and to, to be able to upload an image. We're trying to talk to mobile operators. Mobile operators are asking, well, what's in it for us? How can we make money out of this? I don't know what to tell them, but there you go. Me? Yeah. May I complement that because uh, what Sally said is incredibly important. Uh, um, it's about this this uh, awareness uh, um, uh, and knowledge, you know, about this these new technologies. Uh, this is one of the things that we are trying to address at UNESCO. You know, for we started a series of uh, of uh, you know of uh, MOOCs, you know, these uh, massive online you know uh, uh, open courses, uh, exactly to train judicial actors. And now we're extending it to legislators, to you know, to uh, um, civil servants in the executive sector 
about new technologies. You know, uh, we recently trained, you know, well, recently over, you know, the last few years, we trained 23,000, uh, you know, you know uh, judicial actors exactly on, you know, freedom of expression, access to information and uh, artificial intelligence, because they are asked to educate cases on these things without even understanding, you know, uh, what, what this, these technologies are. And the regulators, legislators, etc. they need to have, you know, to, to learn about that. So this is one of the things. And micro-learning for young people so that they can actually, you know, understand uh, um, what's been done. This is one of the examples of things that we are doing. Plus, media and information literacy is a major part of, uh, of a learning to navigate, you know, uh, uh, digital ecosystems, you know, safely and meaningfully and, uh, and, and take the benefit of, uh, uh, you know, as much as possible on that. Thing. So. Merci. Une question, monsieur Euh, bonjour, Gérard Berry, Collège de France. Je vais parler cet après-midi aussi. Euh, je suis très, très surpris de la confusion de plus en plus grandissante entre les mots algorithme et AI, qui est très dangereuse. Je vais vous expliquer pourquoi. D'abord, parce que la plupart des algorithmes ne sont pas de l'AI. L'AI est une création extraordinaire. Mais il y a énormément d'algorithmes qui ne sont pas de l'AI. Et en particulier, la confusion, on l'a vu ce matin, quand j'ai appris que les universités sélectionnaient les étudiants avec des algorithmes d'AI. Alors ça, c'est tout à fait faux. Et par exemple, en France, je connais bien Parcoursup. Et si vous regardez l'algorithme de Parcoursup qui est publié, il n'a rien à voir avec de l'AI. Et il est parfaitement explicable et expliqué dans des documents de très haute qualité. Où on est en train de le prouver mathématiquement correct. L'AI, c'est autre chose. C'est différent. C'est effectivement l'exploitation de données, mais il y a aussi des algorithmes non AI sur l'exploitation de données. Et après, on parle de l'explicabilité de l'AI. Ça, c'est un sujet extrêmement sérieux, mais il faut se rappeler qu'on peut toujours l'exiger. C'est un problème absolument ouvert. C'est un problème sur lequel les grandes entreprises mondiales recherchent les mathématiciens les plus forts du monde. Et quand on recherche les mathématiciens les plus forts du monde, ce n'est pas pour des problèmes faciles. Ce n'est pas pour des problèmes résolus. Donc, c'est bien d'expliquer. La... Alors, il y a un danger quand même. À... Le sujet est évidemment extraordinairement sérieux parce que les algorithmes d'AI, quand ils s'appliquent, sont très, très puissants. Quand ils s'appliquent, sont très, très puissants. Et bon, mais l'explicabilité est un problème extrêmement sérieux. Et le danger qu'il y a à la requérir, c'est qu'il y a des gens qui vont la vendre. Et ça, ce sera faux. Donc, qui est-ce qui va juger si c'est vrai ou faux Comment vous allez juger si l'AI... Les algorithmes d'IA, je répète, pour les autres, le problème est moins difficile, encore qu'il existe. Euh, qui est-ce qui va juger ça Qui est-ce qui a la compétence pour juger que l'explicabilité est bonne À l'heure actuelle, je suis loin d'être sûr qu'on réponde à cette question et je m'étonne de l'avoir si souvent posée comme si elle était déjà résolue. Merci pour ce qui est de ce que je prends moi une question, qu'une clarification et, et qui permet de faire avancer le débat. Merci, M. Berry. Je crois qu'on avait une question. Euh, et, et on va prendre une, une question supplémentaire et, et ensuite peut-être permettre au, au, au panel de speakers de, de réagir à la fois sur ce que M. Berry vient de dire et, et sur la question qui pourra venir. Merci. Merci. Um, my question is really about the labor movement. And, um, Um, is there a need for the labor movement to change from the industry-based um, organization of workers in a particular factory, a particular workplace, uh, a particular sector, organizing to protect their rights? In the light of the fact that the workplace is so fragmented, that the gig economy has, has so many aspects of micro work, workers that are distributed all over the world, that are almost invisible and that are not connected to one another. And I'm, I'm speaking here, you know, South Africa, the labor movement was one of the primary forces that ended apartheid in my country because it was such a strong labor movement and, and it collaborated it had international solidarity but now it's a labor movement that's become much smaller and much more insular that often opposes the the adoption of technology um, because it in interprets the interest of workers in a narrow way, which is completely understandable. But in the context of organized labor changing and the impacts of digitalization on, 
on the rights of workers being so vast and, and most of those workers not being part of formal organized labor movements, is there a, a, a need for a change in the advocacy of unions, of labor movement? I think what, what Eckhart said about this ecosystem is extremely important. Uh, monitoring, research um, that's broader, that's always been an important part of advocacy for workers' rights, but in partnership with the organized labor movement. And it just feels to me that in the issues we are talking about, and in spite of the incredibly interesting content that, that Christy shared, it seems to me there is a bit of a gap in terms of the organized, the voices of workers, um, perhaps needing to speak in a, in a broader way. But that's the question. Okay, who, who'd like to react in short answers? Christy, maybe? Sure. Um, you know, I welcome this question. I think there's a lot of things uh, in our, uh, a lot of points that are related here, not necessarily one causing the other. And I just want to, let me try to take them, uh, separate it out a bit, um, the arguments that the speaker is making. Um, one is this idea that there are fewer people in unions today than there were um, in the past in many countries and most developed countries uh, the percentage of workers in unions has has declined not necessarily the the total in number but i think that's an important trend that's happening uh, unrelated to technology perhaps connected in some small way but but, um, you know, which is un unrelated to, you know, the advocacy approach, but really just a determined um, effort on the part of many uh, global companies to limit the growth of unions. And that's a big priority for us is to turn that around because obviously we don't have much of a voice in any space, whether it's technology or social protection, if we're not representing more workers. And so that's absolutely, true that we need to have a bigger role if we're going to make a meaningful difference in this debate about about technology for one thing but i think the second thing is this question of unions opposing technology in you know from a narrow kind of perspective which is protecting our members and this is where we also are in many times with climate change as well because you know if the only thing that workers see is a reduced role for them at work and fewer jobs and you know, a worse outcome for their, themselves, for their families. You're taking my job away, replacing me with a robot. You can imagine that opposition is in, inherent in that kind of situation. And that's, and so we called for a just transition, both in climate change and in the case of technology, which is why, in, and we also know that for technology to be implemented successfully, the best outcomes are driven when workers are involved from start to finish, and they're able to see that their job is not threatened, that there will be uptraining or reskilling, or there will be other alternatives if, in fact, the job is, is taken away. But I think this problem of just transition, and again, I raise it, and it also arises in the context of climate, is really central to having unions embrace technology. But that said, you know, I'm in meetings with trade unions every day. I just came from the, uh, the, the conference of the largest union in the UK. Um, and they're not saying they're opposed to technology at all. They're really saying, let's figure out how we can make sure that AI works to benefit everyone, not just more profits for the, you know, whatever the company is, whether it's Amazon or any others, but that we all share in the benefits of AI. We want it to be um, implemented in such a way that we retain dignity at work. It's not stripped away, but we can all share in its benefits. And I know my own organization, um, and we represent 650 unions around the world. Or, uh, we, we've been talking about the um, technology uh, since 2014. We've had a program around this, and very, very uh, engaged in AI discussions for five years at least. I can say we've been in all these various panels. And we're not opposed to technology. We can see the beauty and the benefit and the wonder, and also the fact that it doesn't, it, it doesn't make a difference to oppose it. That's just a futile effort. But let's embrace technology, but make sure it works for everyone. And that that's and also learn about it and learn where the limits are and where do we need to, you know, say, well, this does not work. This is not consistent with human rights, human rights to privacy, human rights to, you know, 
the many, you know, anti-discrimination, there's all these malicious uh, or let's say consequences of technology that are really hard and present real hardships for workers. We need to negotiate around those. I, I want to just finish on one other point about the fragmentation of work now um, and that shouldn't the labor movement change around the fragmentation. I think that, um, yes, there are a lot of smaller workplaces and certainly uh, having the gig economy, which we believe is sort of a, a disguised employment relationship, but then you also have workers at home and, and not in a workplace, which really transforms, you know, 20%, let's say in some countries, it'll be let's around 20% of workers no longer at a work site. That's major. That's a huge shift. Um, so that's fragmentation. The only way we can overcome that and bring workers together is through technology. So we have to think about how we as unions are using technology to reach out to bigger groups and engaging more workers in our work. And I think we've seen that happen during the, this, the life of COVID um, and changed our own style of work. But I, I would say, um, so it, it opens up new opportunities for, for unions and of course new challenges, but it also drives the question of sectoral relationships in um, bargaining, which is something that the workers in many countries have wanted for a long time. You have that in France, you are bargaining on a sectoral level. So on a national level across the sector, which really makes it um, much easier to address sector-wide policy issues because of that framework, but you don't have that in the UK, the US, and you know all of Latin America except Argentina, you don't really have sectoral bargaining. And I think we push on global policy fronts that, we, that sectoral bargaining is what we really need in order to be advocates for the entire labor market in a sector. And that's the role we wanna play and we don't wanna be narrow in just protecting those few workers who have a union but we also have to protect them as well. Thank you. Merci, thank you, thank you, Christy. Thank you very much. Um, merci, effectivement, à tous. Peut-être juste un, un, un mot de conclusion. Uh, on a vu que le sujet était complexe. Uh, Mathias, en tant que président de Hashtag, je suis temps, rappelait l'importance de trouver l'équilibre entre le formidable potentiel de l'intelligence artificielle, sa diffusion, et aussi la protection des travailleurs et le développement de leur autonomie. Moi, j'ai été très touché par vos interventions, les unes et les autres, avec effectivement beaucoup de recommandations, une vision aussi très humaniste et que j'ai trouvé très équilibrée. Euh, intéressant de voir, et c'est ce que disait Oliveira, qu'avant de réinventer beaucoup de choses, si déjà on appliquait euh, le, le Human Rights Framework, si déjà on appliquait ce qui existe dans l'entreprise, ce serait déjà une très très bonne chose. Il y a évidemment le droit à la décision humaine, qui, qui est une manière de contrebalancer et de se donner une ligne directrice tous ensemble sur le sujet. Il y a aussi la nécessité de former et de former les personnes dans l'entreprise et en dehors pour une meilleure compréhension de quoi on parle. Monsieur Berry, vous l'avez rappelé tout à l'heure, il peut y avoir une confusion très rapide entre algorithmes et AI qui amène à ce moment-là des décisions qui ne sont pas forcément les bonnes. Et ça nous amène à ce qu'a rappelé aussi Eckhart sur, sur le, cette notion d'écosystème que rappelait Christy à l'instant et cette nécessité d'engager le dialogue avec l'ensemble des parties prenantes dans l'entreprise et en dehors et avec un rôle clé effectivement que peuvent avoir les syndicats pour trouver en local des solutions par rapport à euh, des, des contextes juridiques qui peuvent effectivement être transposés de façon très arbitraire. C'est ce que rappelait effectivement euh, 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 Célie tout à l'heure. Tout ça nous amène à militer tous ensemble pour un monde plus divers, et, et ça, Eckhart l'a rappelé, c'est une manière aussi d'utiliser l'algorithme, et je crois, en tout cas on pense au sein de l'hashtag le plus important, que c'est une manière de renouer avec l'esprit des Lumières pour le bien des plus grands nombres. Merci beaucoup à toutes et à tous, merci pour vos questions et pour vos participations, je crois qu'on va basculer maintenant sur une pause agréable et, et reprendre ensuite les, les différents travaux. Merci.